Good morning. Uh, first of all, let me congratulate uh, Jarita, my sister, for uh, working very hard and getting this conference to happen, really. I know my name sometimes appears, but really, I've done very, very, very little. And uh, all credit goes to Jarita for the, for the great organization and other uh, the local organization and the SOC as well for, for making sure that we have a, a great conference that this has been in the last few days. I have a pleasure to tell you about a project which has been very close to my heart. By profession, I'm an astronomer and I get paid to do astronomy. But uh, now and then, I'm lucky that I get funding to do this kind of very important uh, work, documenting and presenting to the public uh, the history of astronomy in Africa with the main aim of, um, of drawing young African people, especially in South Africa. We have a very big problem of attracting young black South Africans to do science in general and astronomy in particular. And this is my, my way of contributing to us addressing that, that problem. Okay, so the program, the, the project that I'm talking about, the, the Timbuktu Science Project, is a collaboration between South Africa and Mali. South Africa, the guy there, and Mali, the guy. I don't know whether I can control that. Yeah, okay. So South Africa, the guy, and Mali, the guy. And uh, basically, it was a collaboration between the two countries, and it was supported at a very high uh, government level. Uh, so we had scholars from South Africa, and Professor Brian Mona, who was here yesterday, was, all, was part of the South African team, and I was the project PI, um, and we also had a team of Malians, scholars in various disciplines, physics, astronomy, and so on, and, uh, and translators as well from Mali. So that all the translations, all the results that I'll be presenting here will be based on the translations done by our Malian counterparts. Uh, yeah, and the, and the, the project was really well funded by the South African government, Department of Science and Technology. So let me give you some background on uh, why Timbuktu. Well, this is not a very good map, uh, but it gives you an idea. So Timbuktu is really on the border between the Sahara and uh, West Africa. It was founded about 900 years ago by Tuaregs, very near the, uh, the banks of the Niger River. And it has been under various empires over the last thousand years or more. Uh, the first empire was the one which occupied this area here uh, with, the, with the brown border called the Ghana Empire. It has no relationship to the present day Ghana <coughs> somewhere here. And uh, it was during the Ghana Empire that trade uh, started in a big way between West Africa and North Africa. And with trade came Islam. Uh, um, to the, the Ghana, to these areas here of West Africa. So those were the first seeds of Islamic learning uh, in West Africa generally. And uh, so people of the Ghana Empire adopted Islam and started having schools. And when the empire ended about a thousand years ago, many of the scholars dispersed. Some of them went to Timbuktu and uh, started scholarship there and so on. Um, that's right, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, really the, the glory days of, of this uh, the scholarship in Timbuktu was in the 1500s during the Songhai Empire, which is uh, uh, this <coughs> reddish kind of uh, border there. Uh, that is when a lot of scholarship took place in, uh, in Timbuktu. And there was a lot of book trade between Tim, uh, Timbuktu and the rest of the Islamic world in North Africa and in the Middle East. And so this is one, a street scene in Timbuktu. On the right is the Jingeri Bear Mosque, which was uh, built in the 1300s uh, by Mansa Musa, one of the, uh, the emperors of the, Ghana, of the Mali Empire, when after his first major Hajj or pilgrimage to mosque, I mean to uh, Mecca, he brought with him some, uh, some architects who helped him construct this big uh, mosque made out of uh, 
uh, as you all call it, uh, mud, mud building, basically mud construction. But it has been held like that for a very long time uh, because people every year they they, you know, they replenish the walls and things like that. And there's not huge amount of rainfall in that in that part of the world. <coughs> okay. As I said, well, and there's another famous uh, mosque associated with scholarship in Timbuktu. Some people call this mosque uh, university, but it was really not a university in the modern sense of the word, because these were individual scholars who were not organized into a structure that, that we call a university today. Okay? So this Sankara mosque was associated with scholarship, and as I said, the culture of learning reached its peak in the 1500s under the Songhai Empire. And unfortunately, it suffered a major disruption in 1591 when Timbuktu was invaded by Morocco and many of the scholars were uh, exiled to, to various areas, some in North Africa, uh, some in, uh, in, in the rest of West Africa as well. And uh, I mean, this is an example of, a, of how these manuscripts look like, loose uh, sheets of of paper with all the, the writing in it. Uh, some of them have a, a leather covering and things like that. And most of the, the books are written in Arabic, but some of them are written in local languages, in Songhai and in uh, the Tuareg language, Tamashek, I think. Okay? Then I said before, there was a thriving book trade uh, between Mali and the, the rest of the Islamic world, but also lots of local scholars wrote their own books, uh, and the, the books covered Quranic studies, medicine, astronomy, and mathematics. Okay. And what struck us when we studied these books was that there was no mention of, lo what, of what we call uh, African, local African, pre-Islamic uh, uh, cultural astronomy in, in these books. It's a very interesting uh, uh, thing why, why that is so. And here I list some of the prominent scholars that are known in, uh, by the scholars of Islam. I mean, Baba definitely appears in, uh, in many of the references that I've read on, uh, not necessarily for astronomy, but for his law, Islamic law, uh, 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 I mean, publications and things like that. He published around 60 books on Islamic law, and he's one of the people who were exiled, exiled in Morocco in 1592. And that actually helped his reputation even more because people were just impressed at his, uh, his abilities as a scholar. But Ahmed Baba, famous as he was, was a student of this lesser known man called Mohammed Bagayogo al Wangari. He died in 1594. And, I mean, as I said, he was a teacher of Ahmed Baba. Okay. And another example is this Mahmoud Kati, who lived in the 1500s and was related to Askia Mohammed who was the, the second emperor of the Songhai Empire. Okay? So, the, the presentation of, uh, of what we find in, I mean, my, my, most of my presentation will be based on the two manuscripts written by these two authors here. Yeah? And unfortunately, both of them uh, are from the 1700s, and we have not really found uh, any uh, book on astronomy uh, that older than uh, these two. Both of these books are 100 page long. I, I mean, each of them is 100 page long, and I just thought I would mention their names here. One of them is Mohammed Bagayogo Gurdu, who was the academic great grandson of Mohammed Bagayogo that I told you about before. And this one, and he lived definitely in Timbuktu, and I'll show you a diagram that I got from one of the books that indicates uh, where he stands with respect to the other uh, scholars that I mentioned. And the other one is Abu Abbas. He originates in the north, from the north of Timbuktu, but uh, I mean in his book he, he does mention Ahmed Baba and he also indicates that he knows Timbuktu. So he could be from Timbuktu or he could have spent, could have been just a visitor in Timbuktu. And so this not very clear diagram shows you uh, the, how the knowledge was transmitted by the various scholars uh, dating back to the earlier times uh, to the various, uh, uh, through various scholars. But the most important thing to note, and unfortunately this is not very clear, is to notice that there's this guy here, Mohammed Bagayogo, who was a teacher of Ahmed Baba, 
who was the teacher of Mahmoud Burdu, who was the teacher of Mahmoud Burdu, uh, and, and Mohammed Bagayo Burdu. And this, this guy here is one of the, the authors of the, the work that I would present to me. So he was, that's what I meant that he was an academic great grandfather of, uh, I mean, that Mohammed Bagayo was an academic great grandfather of this man who died in the early 1700s, around the 1720. Okay, so there is a very nice picture that, I, that makes me very proud because that's me that had to believe. I was much younger than back then. Uh, in front of that building, which was the house of Mohammed uh, Bagayo uh, in the 1500s. And this guy lived around the time of Tycho Brahe and all those great astronomers from Europe. Uh, and I hope that one day I'll find a, a manuscript written by him on astronomy because in one of the books that I'll be presenting, uh, they mentioned that this Bagayo, Mohammed Bagayo, uh, Wangari, was a student of Al Tajuri, and Al Tajuri was a famous astronomer <coughs> from North Africa in the 1500s. And so it's possible that this Bagayo, I'm sure Bagayo knew astronomy, and it is possible that maybe he wrote something and that lays that lies undiscovered. <clears throat> this is how a page from one of his books by <coughs> Abu Abbas looks like. Um, note the different colors, and I think the different colors, one is the original uh, writing, and the different color is the comment on the, on the original writing. So these two books are commentaries on books, uh, original books written by Elia, Islamic scholars from, from North Africa. So most of these uh, books here are just commentaries on of original works uh, by area scholars. And this is just another page from uh, the second book by Bayou, whom I call by Bayou Jr. And the thing that really convinced us that our project will work was this uh, record, which was first published by uh, other groups of scholars, um, Henwick, John Henwick, Henwick, who has been studying Arabic literature in West Africa, he discovered this record of a meteor shower in 1583, and I can read it for you if you want. Uh, in the year 991, which in, in the modern calendar is 1583, in God's month of Rajab, which is August, after half the night had passed, stars flew around the sky as if fire had been kindled in the whole sky, east, west, north, and south. It became a mighty flame lighting up the earth, and people were extremely disturbed about that. It continued uh, until after dawn, recorded by the humble servant of his Lord, Al-Fati Gati Mahmoudi, one of the scholars I mentioned before. I mean, that clearly is a, a record of something that looked like this, meteor showers, when there's a lot of uh, shooting stars uh, in the sky. Okay. So that, that convinced us that uh, I'm sure we were going to find something interesting. This record here was not in an astronomy book. This was on the margins of a book that had nothing to do with astronomy. So he was just maybe reading the book and then he witnessed this event and he noted it on the margin of his book. So really uh, there's a lot, I'm sure we can find a lot uh, uh, of records, astronomical records like that. And of course, the interesting thing is that this record was made 11 years uh, after Tycho Brahe recorded uh, a supernova uh, in 1572. So I'm sure this guy <coughs> probably, maybe he did uh, notice that supernova, and maybe if we search that, we could find his own version of uh, his observation of that supernova. So this is really an extremely uh, important collection for astronomy, and also I'll show you how that, that it's a very important collection, these books, for, for a study of African history, and also even Arabic history. I mean, I'm sure it is possible that there are many books that, were, that are lost to the world, which might be found in these collections uh, in Timbuktu. And what I didn't tell you was that uh, these books are all over Africa. I mean, from the west in Senegal all the way to the east, in Sudan and so on. So, I mean, people can make many, 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 many careers out of 
studying this kind of books. And this is very really uncharted territory. I mean, this is, uh, this is just the beginning. I think our group was the first group to really do it in this way. So uh, with funding and with uh, lots of students, you can do a lot more. And um, maybe, I mean, at this point, I should also tell you that unfortunately, in, in 2008, funding for our project stopped probably because there was a change of government, whatever, but uh, I was very sad uh, to see that happen because, I mean, the project underwent a thorough review uh, by the National Research Foundation and it passed the review and uh, still it was not funded. Very sad. Okay, so what do we find in the books? Uh, we find the model of the solar system. Again, if you allow me, I can read it for you. Uh, this is direct quotation and quote of what is, uh, was written, translation of what is written in these books. Uh, he said that the orbits that God created in heaven are nine, seven of, seven of them bear planets, the eighth bears some other stars, the ninth is void of planets. The illustration of that is the moon is in the orbit next to us, so in this model the, the moon is closest to the earth, there is no other planet next to us not the, except the moon, if not the moon, except those stars that are said to be uh, used for to throw at the devil, something like that. So, so uh, the moon is closest, the closest planet to us, but closer, even closer than the moon, uh, are these stars which are used to throw at the devil. So, these are the the shooting stars. So, the shooting stars are closer to the moon, the closer to the earth than the moon. After the moon comes Mercury. Uh, he hinted that the orbit is bigger than the one below it and smaller than the planet above it, something like that. Uh, the third is Venus, the fourth is the Sun, the fifth is Mars, the sixth bears Jupiter, the seventh Saturn, the eighth bears other planets rather than this. So this, the eighth is for the stars, the ninth is empty. This means that there is no planet there, but, the, but eight planets share it. Every one of them rotates around it and once every day, a night with the mind of God. The orbit is where a planet makes a round voyage. God said every one of them swims in an orbit. We are at the center of the orbit. So there is a description of a of really ancient Greek uh, model of the solar system or model of the universe that found its way into Islamic uh, astronomy and that found its way into West Africa via trade and, 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 and in that way. Okay. And they even explain what the, the different orbits are. Yeah. So this this is uh, this is what people were studying in the 1700s in West Africa. And in fact, Abu Abbas, the one of the authors of these books that I'm presenting, uh, mentions in the introduction of his book that he wrote that book, which was 100 pages long, uh, after the request, upon the request of his students to do so. Uh, so apparently, students needed a textbook uh, or something like that, a textbook on, on basic astronomy. And that is what uh, was included. And, and, in, and Abu Abbas's book is very interesting because it includes a lot of uh, mathematical, mathematical algorithms on how to calculate various aspects of the Islamic calendar as well. So I, I didn't include uh, anything like that, but I mean, it was nice to confirm. He even gave examples of how to apply those algorithms. And we tested all of those algorithms, and they, they do what we wrote computer programs based on the, the algorithms, and we confirmed that they were correct. <clears throat> so we also find a lot of uh, a couple of manuscripts that involve uh, how to calculate things like the, the latitude of a place, and they, they mentioned that they do that by using the uh, the pole star polaris and also using a quadrant like that. Yeah, and we also <coughs> hear of how they calculated the longitude of a place by using the lunar eclipse. So someone would be sitting in Timbuktu and another one in Mecca observing the same lunar eclipse and timing when that takes place and the difference in time would give you the difference in the longitude of the place. That's how they used to, to calculate these things. And they would use those differences to calculate something called the Indian Circle, where this is the location of a person, and they want to find direction to Mecca. This is north, that is south, 
that is east and west. And so you are located there in Timbuktu, you work out the, uh, the latitude difference there in Mecca, uh, w w with respect to someone in Mecca, and the longitude difference from the, uh, the lunar eclipse, as I said before, and this line here which you draw on the, on the ground point uh, shows you where you should point when you're praying, uh, when you do your prayers. Okay, so that's how they apply <coughs> their knowledge. And during the day, they use the measure time by looking at the, the length of the gnomon, um, which was standard anyway. And that's how, and for example, but the different lengths of the shell uh, told them, gave them an idea of when to, uh, to do different uh, Islamic prayers, you know, the, the midday prayer, the afternoon prayer, and things like that. And at night, they use lunar mansions which was explained a few days ago, I think, or yesterday, uh, that we have these different uh, asterisms where the moon which appear to be visited by the moon as it goes around the earth, and uh, they use that in the evening to, to determine time. I mean, the, the, the time difference between the occurrence of two successive lunar mansions is approximately an hour, not exactly, but approximately. Okay, so all of this I've presented before uh, in a paper or various uh, publications, but my talk today really is about the updates. What have we done uh, since the last publication of our work? And that work was published in the year 2008. Okay, so I'll first summarize the achievement of our project. We translated 28 out of 35 manuscripts from the Amir Baba Center. Only that uh, library, which is the main public or government library in Timbuktu, and most of them are commentaries on the web by two Maghribi scholars. One is Abu Mukri. This man was a scholar or an astronomer in the 1200s. Uh, he wrote a poem, and a lot of the, the books or the manuscripts we found were commentaries on this man's poem. Abu Mukri, have 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, and another one is this Al Tajuri who lived in the 1500s uh, that I told you about. So, uh, Muhammad Bagayogo Gurdu, or Muhammad Bagayogo Jr., a book was a commentary on Al Tajuri, and Abu Labas uh, wrote a comment, his book was a commentary uh, for all on that Abu Mukri there. Okay, and we also found some astronomy poems. These are really, uh, they are not. Something, uh, they are not uh, things to enjoy, these astronomy poems, <laughs> because they are very hard to read, to understand, and uh, our translators simply could not translate them. And we collaborated with people in Germany, uh, and an institute of Islamic history of astronomy, they could not translate those poems. So these are very, very hard. I mean, they are supposed to be uh, made for people to make it easy for students to learn astronomy but they are really, really hard to, to translate, okay? And also we found uh, one astronomical zich, uh, which is a whole collection of, of this table. A zich is a data, astronomical data table, and it contains all kinds of information and data that you need to calculate time precisely and, and other similar kind of, of calculations. And this is a very interesting find because I gave it to the experts in Frankfurt, as I said, and uh, they found that it was a collection of zijis from Ibn Yunis. Ibn Yunis was a 10th century astronomer, Egyptian astronomer, Islamic astronomer, and uh, they discovered a table or two in this collection that had never been seen before. And this highlights really why our project is very important for Islamic astronomy and for, for, for the history of astronomy in uh, Islam and also in, in, in Africa. Because, as I said before, I mean, there are a lot of books like this that have been lost, and I'm sure some of them will have been uh, kept in collections in places like Timbuktu and so on. That was, that's very exciting. Right? We still haven't published this work, so this is one of the things that really requires urgent attention regarding getting it to be published. Okay? And some of the challenges we experienced, well, I refuse to believe that, I mean, astronomy in Timbuktu or West Africa, Islamic astronomy only started in the 1700s. 
as I said, indications are that the senior uh, Mohammed Bagayogo already, I mean, was working, was studied under an astronomer in the 1500s. And we even know that Ahmed Baba himself, the most famous author from Timbuktu, wrote a two-page manuscript on astronomy. We haven't looked at it yet. Uh, and so I think we can push these dates earlier. But right now, this is all I can I mean, tell you about the 70, from the 1700s. And uh, this, what I said before earlier, I mean, maybe on Sunday, was that I have been to a school outside Timbuktu where students today still use this manuscript, manuscripts to study astronomy in their schools. Okay, um, yeah, I mean, Baba, yes, as, as I said, and so the question is where are the earlier texts? Another problem was dating the manuscripts. Not all the manuscripts were complete. In fact, many of them were not complete. And the complete ones usually have the name of the author and the date that the manuscript was written or copied at the very last page. And unfortunately, many of these manuscripts, that page is missing. So we have come up with uh, ideas of how to address the issue of dating and even to assist the people are helping to preserve these manuscripts with uh, with technology. And so, again, as part of the project, we started the idea of uh, trying to, to develop uh, skills in being able to study these manuscripts uh, using, uh, I mean, that's a Raman spectrometer which my university bought for us when I joined them five years ago. A very high state of the art instrument that already has led to two publications uh, by my student, my PhD student. Last year was the first time we published uh, on this. Although the topic is, I mean, we published, so this year we published on the Mosbauer spectroscopy to analyze, you know, the ion content so that we can tell whether the books were, the level of degradation in the books. Uh, but this can be applied to Timbuktu manuscript if we can lay our hands on this manuscript, which right now is a little bit hard. And in fact, it's always been hard because uh, you know, those people really they treat them as if they are both, which they should. And lastly, we published another paper by my PhD student again on uh, you know, using all these various scientific methods to, to study paper and ink and so on. And the next step will be uh, we are making collaborations with people around the country, physicists around the country, to try and do carbon dating or um, accelerator mass spectroscopy. Uh, to directly date the manuscript. But again, the problem there is accessing the manuscript. Uh, and the techniques that we are using are, are, are not invasive. I mean, we won't be cutting a huge chunk of the manuscript. We'll just be taking microscopic samples of those manuscripts. So if we get funding, I hope we'll get funding for it. And also, I hope we'll get uh, someone to speak on our behalf to, uh, to ask Malians to let us access the manuscript. And we hope that things are stable there, that we can actually go and visit Timbuktu and take those samples. Uh, what we are working on, and again this depends a little bit on funding as well, is we have looked at all <coughs> the catalogs from the Ahmed Baba Center, which is this library, the government library in Timbuktu. They have about 30,000 manuscripts in their collection. Uh, they've cataloged only like less than 10,000 or 9,000 of them. We have looked at all the astronomy entries in that catalog, and uh, we are compiling a big paper with my collaborators in Germany in Frankfurt to try and just give a physical description and, and even say something about the content of those uh, all of, of all of the astronomy manuscripts that have been documented in the Ahmed Baba Center. Okay, and also we have published this book here, which is a high school kind of book. Uh, which really is, I mean, if I wrote, I'm the author, I'm allowed to say something good about it. Um, it's a, it combines history, combines geography, combines mathematics, and so on for high school. So, and it's published by Cambridge University Press. Again, this is one of the, the outcomes. And it was published, I think, in 2011 or so, or 2010. So that's the update. And that's a very sad picture that I saw, and some of you have seen. These are the manuscripts that were burned by the people who invaded Timbuktu three, four years ago. The good story, though, is that uh, 
not many of the manuscripts were destroyed. I believe that uh, when the locals heard that trouble was coming, they moved huge chunks of this manuscript to the southern part of the country, which was stable at the time. And so maybe a very few thousands, maybe 2,000 or so, of these books have been burned. So really, it's really fantastic that they could do this, this thing here. Conclusion, uh, I have a, I mean, this is my really great ambition, and I'm sure you all are contributing to that ambition. We want to be able to, like in other uh, continents, map out the history of astronomy in Africa, starting with cultural astronomy, which is a living astronomy as well, going through medieval astronomy, although medieval is a European construct because it defines a certain period during the European history, but a lot of these things were written around the... I mean, a lot of this could be considered medieval, uh, Arabic or, or um, astronomy, and modern astronomy. So uh, uh, we try to build this kind of picture. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm glad that uh, I'm allowed to come and talk about these things in a forum like this, and, and, and also allowed to publish these kind of things, because we, we, we want to build a, a picture of a complete picture of astronomy, history of astronomy in Africa. And, and this is, a, I think, a significant contribution. And as I said, there's more that needs to be done. There's more, we need to search for more of these uh, astronomy uh, manuscripts for many reasons that I've given before. We need to study them and we need to push the dates back to earlier times to see when astronomy began to be taught in Timbuktu schools. And hopefully, in my talk, I have shown you the kind of astronomy that was taught in, uh, in Timbuktu uh, madrasas over 300 years ago. And I will end there. Thank you, Tebby. Um, do we have any questions? Perhaps I wonder if we could get Leslie set up while we're answering questions. <laughs>